Welcome everyone. For those who are just joining us, we're we're just uh, letting people trickle in to our to our digital room, our digital studios tonight. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm Nova Benway. I'm the director of Triangle, um, and I'll be hosting tonight um, with our three artist presentations. We'll just wait a couple minutes for for people to kind of trickle in, um, but we'll get started very soon. And in the meantime, I'm seeing a lot of people who I know have a history with Triangle, uh, whether as alumni or as future Triangle artists. And if people wanna put, put in the chat, they have a connection to Triangle. It's always really nice to hear about that. And for our current artists, you know, who are presenting tonight to know, to know who's in the room. So, um, if you have a connection to Triangle, or if you're, you know, someone who's new to, to us and is not familiar with Triangle, you can let us know that too. So if folks want to post in the chat um, where they're where they're coming from, where they're tuning in from, um, and what their connection to, to Triangle is or may be or or may not be, um, that would be that would be lovely. Um, but we'll get started in another second or two. And you're very welcome to have your camera on. Um, you're welcome to have it off if you're more comfortable, but it's always nice for those presenting to kind of see, to see who's here with us. Um, so I know I myself go back and forth when I'm attending events, sort of <laughs> whether I wanna be, you know, known to the world or not, but, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's lovely either way. Um, uh, we're seeing a, a shout out for Slinko, who's our first um, presenter tonight, our first speaker. Awesome. And I'm noticing, I don't know if other people are seeing this, but um, there's a glitch, which I've occasionally seen in Zoom and I'm seeing it tonight, where people are named Triangle Association instead of their, instead of their name. And you can change that if you, if you would like by, if you hover over your screen, there should be a little blue, button with three dots. And if you click on that, there's an option to rename yourself. So if you want to do that, that's just some kind of strange glitch that sometimes happens in Zoom. So if you see yourself named Triangle Association um, <laughs> and, you, and you wanna represent who you actually are, you're welcome to change that. Uh, it's like hovering over um, hovering over your, your image and then there's these three blue dots. If you click on that, there should be an option to rename. Um, All right, so I think we'll get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here, welcome. Um, I'm Nova Benway, I'm the director of Triangle. We, for those who are not familiar, we're a residency program for visual artists located in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Uh, we were founded by artists way back in 1982 and it's been our vision ever since to provide a life-changing working environment for committed artists through studio-based opportunities to experiment, to create new work um, through shared community with other artists that we hope will last a lifetime, um, through introducing relevant experts such as curators to the work at crucial times and through events like this, um, cultivation of new audiences with public programs like Open Studios. So just briefly how the event will run. Um, this event is being recorded. So if you prefer not to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. Um, Presentations by the artists, because um, they'll be showing some images and video, are best viewed on speaker view. Uh, you can change the setting on the top right corner of your Zoom screen. So just change it between gallery view and speaker view. And we'll put this in the chat as well, so you'll see um, those instructions. Closed captions are available. Um, participants must have the closed captions button turned on in order to set up or view captions in Zoom events. This setting is turned on by default for all Zoom users and can be found in my account settings in meeting advanced. And again, we'll put all of this information in the chat for your reference. To learn more about Triangle and the artists we support, go to triangleartsnyc.org. Um, and if you need assistance during this event, chat directly to Triangle Arts. You should see a Triangle Arts logo um, for tech support. So, I'm really thrilled to introduce the three artists you will hear from tonight, Slinko, Ilana Harris-Babu, and Jeffrey Maris, who have been in residence with us this summer. 
Uh, this event tonight will be a series of three 30 minute presentations by each artist with time for questions at the end of each session. So please add your questions in the chat. You can raise your hand when we open uh, the questions at the end, which the speakers will address as time allows. Uh, and we really welcome questions. So again, the best way to ask a question is either to post it in the chat, or if you'd like to be unmuted and speak, um, you can raise your hand once we open for questions at the end of each presentation. Um, we'll also ask each artist to post contact info, um, their website or a way to get in touch with them um, in the chat so you can reach out afterward if you'd like to know more about their work. Um, just one final note, please keep yourself muted so we can reduce background noise and we can hear the artists a bit better. Um, so with that, uh, to begin, I'm really happy to introduce our first speaker, Slinko. Uh, and Slinko, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, hi, everybody. I can't see everyone, um, and it would make me too nervous anyway. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah. So I'm going to start sharing and speaking. Um, can everyone see the first slide that says everything must go? Okay. So uh, I would like to present this one project that I specifically uh, been working on for quite a while. And it's basically a fieldwork in history and a fieldwork in flea markets across Ukraine. So it starts with this event, uh, 1991, the collapse of Soviet Union, which was of course very fundamental for my identity. Um, and also the time that I came to the United States, I came in 96 shortly after. And uh, what I wanted to do is to go across this flea markets to collect this video field work and uh, think about how the change in the economic structure changes human relationships and how that affects um, all other things. So this is what you see is how the currency collapsed and it quickly went from you know, one, two, three to numbers like 500,000 and go and so on and so on. In the video, you, you will see um, a, a, a bill that's like 1 million. So here's some just some steals where uh, I did the field work, which is this is Petrivka market in Kiev. And this is some representations of kind of very humble, very, you know, of no value things being sold today, but they pretty much reflect the the mood and the confusion and the attempt to survive that was in the 90s that I'm trying to revisit through this project. A lot of attention has been paid to the actual transactions in the market because, you know, in the classic framework of Marxism, social relations are affected by how we transact with each other and how we relate to each other. And uh, the market shift from the state owned economy to the market owned economy has affected um, personal identity of a lot of people, but also it was the birth of oligarchy of the state assets being sold out to foreign investment. So that actually affects this sense of an idea of dispossession that I am thinking about in this project. Um, and I enter it through my personal memory, but right now I want to present you a, a very short trailer of the video. And it's structured as a, a session between a hypnotist and a patient. And the patient is trying to remember the country that no longer exists. And the way she's trying to do it by entering the documentary um, footage as her memory, and then she pulls back into the black screen and sees all these objects that's supposed to trigger her memory. So this is going to start kind of dark and slow. And let me know if there's any issues. Your eyes get heavy. You are very tired and drowsy. Your eyes are closing, closing. You feel drowsier and drowsier, very sleepy, very tired. Is there anything unusual going on? I'm listening. 
listening to a radio and everything is like every other day. But the president who returned to power from house arrest after the failure of the August coup never recovered his authority. The man with no country left to govern said he was leaving the nation in a better state than he'd found it and described some of the achievements of his rule. Мы наследники великой цивилизации. И сейчас от всех и каждого зависит, чтобы она возвратилась к новой, современной и достойной жизни. I'm at the flea market. People are selling all kinds of things. Мы тут продаем всем. Иди до всего. А дед сколько? Сколько дед? Дед? А как даем? Let's return to that place again. You were looking for something. Something important? Yeah, I just want to feel it again. That sense of belonging. My memories, they are fading. I don't know. But sometimes I see something and feelings come back. Да, все-таки обидно. Украина такое богатое государство было. Оно тоже живи и радуйся жизни, понимаешь? Кучка она нажилась людей и все. Остальные остались нищими. Ну и нищету я почувствовал нищету, когда мы по бартеру менялись. Teachers, scientists, engineers selling bras and stockings. There was a limited amount of money. There were these coupons. There were pieces of paper. People received millions of them, millions of coupons. The shops had nothing. There were jars with enormous pickles and sometimes sauerkraut. What else we experienced? У меня были свои огороды, выращивалась в основном подсолнух. Now that my memories are coming back a little, I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. You are not sure the country existed at all? Um, Every memory is buried somewhere deep in your mind. I'm here to help you recover it. All this time, I was looking for something, a disappeared country. I can sense disappointment. Well, our time is running out. I'm scared. I know. I can see your body tensing up. But let's remember that you came here willingly, looking for a solution to your problem. Не 73 відсотки, які за мене голосували, а всі 100 відсотків українців. Це не моя, це наша спільна перемога. Європейська країна починається з кожного. Так, ми обрали шлях до Європи, але Європа не десь там. Європа, вона ось тут. Um, can everybody see the next slide? Okay. So the video was, uh, it was a trailer version. So it's going to be about 30 minutes. Uh, it might not have given you like a full story arc, but I hope it gave you a sense of structure and a sense of what I'm um, trying to work with. So the field of the video was mostly this memory and recall and remembering. Um, it's almost like the members of the Soviet Union were dismembered and now I'm kind of trying to piece together the memory as part of my previous identity and map it over onto what I am right now. 
it's not very actually uh, one to one in terms of being very personal. It's it's a script. It's written. So there's a bigger version I will put in the chat that you can check out if you are so inclined. But uh, now I would like to shift to present you uh, a second part of this project, which is these drawings uh, based on this fieldwork. And this is the first kind of week that I came to Triangle. I came kind of was already started um, sketches for this idea that I had. And the idea I had was to develop a language of dispossession and erasure, the language of not being able to hold on to things, um, um, especially in this, in this um, kind of like economic survival stress uh, historic context, but just in general, survival is pretty stressful. Um, so at first I thought about it as separate drawings and every week I would change my mind and I did all these studies there, you know, there's nothing wrong with the drawing. It's a nice drawing, but I kept feeling like it doesn't do anything. So I started reducing the way I draw and reducing the image, trying to keep only necessary things. As if, you know, like the, the visual itself has only so much to give. So this is one of the drawings that I felt like kind of touching on that, that, that language. And then this is the first version of where I decided the drawings have to be directly on the wall and the drawings cannot be uh, possessed. They cannot be taken off and they cannot be preserved. So they have this built-in lack of possession, lack of property, and also they're kind of doomed because they're gonna be painted over. Um, the number was also appealing to me in terms of thinking of a historic event as a number, which is very abstract, but yet it's very specific to me. And it's very specific in the line of history. Um, so I tried this, uh, but eventually I decided that this wasn't working as well because it kept it from giving the power to the visual language. The number was kind of anchoring it too much. But here are some details of that attempt. And then I realized because I was drawing from uh, the footage that I shot, I was able to reference like any movement I wanted within that context. So I started redrawing a few frames apart as if it was stop motion, not really wanting to do anything animated, but mostly looking at micro movements and of actual transaction, almost kind of doing like the forensic analysis of the transactions in the market, how, how things are touched, how things are handled, how, what is the moment when the thing leaves your hand. And so here are some um, other studies from that kind of thinking. And that led me to the next step um, and the final kind of version that I was able to accomplish here. So I'm now on a other wall, different wall behind me. And um, this is kind of the scale of the work. So this is a 10 feet ladder, I think. Um, it was very useful to learn that the drawings they're more like a field work itself. It's kind of, the composition is not fixed. Uh, the things have no boundaries. The things have no hierarchies. And it's kind of uh, started to talk to me that language that I was trying to develop. So here I'm building this drawing layer by layer. Um, it's kind of a fun process. It could be difficult if it's 90 degrees in the studio, <laughs> but um, I uh, did it. Uh, so here I'm going to show some, um, you know, close ups because unfortunately you can't be in the studio, all of you who are watching, but it would have been fun. Um, so here is more layered. Every day I would come and I put more layers and more details. And what happens, I think, is on one hand, you building up these layers and it's supposed to give some kind of like enriched value to this. Um, drawing or to this work, but in fact, it actually almost destroys the previous layer. So everything that overrides the thing underneath is, is like ripping it out, essentially denying it its own significance. And that was very interesting to me. And I think 
this is a good direction for this work. So here's another um, detail. And I will show the full work, but these are details at the bottom of the drawing where it's not about hands, but it's about this ridiculous, completely stupid objects that are for sale. With, and the only value they actually have is like either personal appeal um, or some kind of use value. There is, of course, I couldn't resist in this specific shot. Uh, there is like a ghosted image of Lenin bust because I felt like, you know, I didn't want to have very um, obvious references to, to that, but I couldn't part with it either. So I just kind of left this blank space. And the SpongeBob was right next to the bus. This was from actual um, documentary photograph. And I thought, how ridiculous this relationship between Lenin and SpongeBob, like that doesn't happen anywhere else. It happens only at the flea market. Um, here, I also work from a direct, um, you know, observation and documentation where people at the market, everything is on the ground and everything is laid out on these little pieces of fabric. They're almost like these little territories, this little, uh, you know, you claim a little space for yourself and you lay down the clothes of your, of your back to sell and then you hold them down with rocks so they wouldn't fly out or fly off um, with the wind. So I was very into these shoes, as you could tell. I uh, been redrawing them several times. I think this is maybe an okay direction. A little note on the color. I kept thinking how, you know, in the, in the moving image, things change all the time. In the market, things also take place of other things every day, every instance they change. So the ghosted um, colors here, they're in my mind, they were from a pair, uh, like a previous pair of sneakers, maybe that got sold, and then these shoes took place of that position. And there's like this ridiculous overlap that doesn't make actual sense. Um, here's some stones. I had actually a very uh, difficult time drawing stones. They looked at the, like potatoes a, a lot of the times. <laughs> They look like other things, but finally I settled on this kind of solution where they're not fully rendered, but they're kind of rocky looking. Um, here I include some really detailed shots of very, very small drawings within the big uh, composition. It's another detailed shot. And, and basically at the end of the drawing and working, I decided to push it a little bit even over the edge to create this uh, complete kind of negation of the previous images. So this is the current buildup on the wall. And this is the current um, composition on the wall. So I think my head is about slightly above the pink coat if I stand next to it. And, um, and this work would not have been really possible and wouldn't have happened if I didn't get this opportunity actually because the walls in my basement where I usually work, they're just slightly above my head. So the mind doesn't think above that. You know, the mind is kind of going sideways and very small. So once I got here, I was very excited. But also the big walls kind of contributed uh, to the direction and the attempt and uh, the excitement that I have had here so far. So I, um, my presentation is complete now, and I can open it to questions. Yeah, so if folks wanna either post your, you can post your question in the chat and I can, I can share it with Slinko or Slinko, you can read it. Or um, if you would like to speak, um, if you just raise your hand, we can, we can kind of call on you, so to speak. Um, but why don't we take a second for people to just um, process. I see, I see someone I know, Toysha is raising her hand, physical hand. Sure, yeah. Can you unmute yourself or do we need to do that? No, I, I believe I unmuted myself. Yeah, I raised my hand because I, I don't know how to do it in the thing. <laughs> sure. uh, Me neither. You know, so, so my question, well, it's like two. I have two questions. Um, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's intentional or some conscious, but in your drawing, do you, do you see the infinite symbol that you have? 
um, in the, you know, the oh. symbol. And the reason I asked this is because you, like, when you're talking about um, the market and what's happening in the market, it, it kind of sounds like you're talking about it as like this, like, static thing that actually does change each day but like all i could see was like this is this this is literally stuff from like 40 years ago and and it's the same loop of exchange of money in the same um and it, it's just like this infinite loop of just no movement um and so when you're talking about going back to you know trying to to find this country that you left it's like but it's still there because it's literally the same loop of stuff so, I don't know if that's a question. What's the question? Uh, okay, I'll answer your question. So yeah, I didn't see like the, you know, I don't have that kind of obsession with uh, numbers <laughs> um, or signs. I'm gonna look for it once this is over. But uh, on the on the other note of oh, this is old stuff. It's that kind of thing that actually I am trying to process is. For me, this project is almost like a, a way of exercise that passed to get rid of it, actually. And the only way I can get rid of this connection to these things that are in the past for everybody else, including myself, is actually by like redressing them in some way. The past isn't, um, the past is never just uh, un, unmutable or unchanged. Well, it's very active, like the memory is active because we're constantly recalling it for different purposes. You know, we're using history for different political purposes, for different social purposes. So it's not, uh, it's unstable all the time. So the only way to kind of like make your, make your peace with it is to constantly reprocess it. It's almost, an, uh, it's almost like a routine exercise. Um, I don't know if that answers, uh, but that's what I got. Thank you. I have another question from Layla. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, I don't have a question, but I thought it's a nice feedback if I share it with you. Uh, actually, this uh, drawing of yours reminded me in a story. Uh, I'm from Iran and uh, one of my uncles decided to save some money when he was young exactly 40 years ago and uh, he converted some of the Iranian currency like the money that he saved to the currency of like the country that you're exactly talking about and then the whole country fall apart and he was telling me the whole money that he had one of a sudden in just like a few moments it became like worthless yeah. and so these drawings of yours like the hands that are exchanging these currencies to each other but it's not connected to a known source i'm just seeing the hand and the money but I don't know who is it and where is the source it really reminded me the whole story of my uncle actually and I really love your uh, mark making because I think this like uh, motion in it it is really reflecting to the uh, memory and disappearing so when I'm seeing the whole drawing on the wall I can really uh, uh, feel that and it's so interesting I just remembered this story of my uncle that I felt like I should share it with you that's a, that's a very cool story uh, but yeah it's exactly what happened Over, overnight the money was not worth anything and we're talking about the Soviet ruble and then it became all this paper money that was uh, ridiculous. I mean, they were so anybody could have falsified them. How much time do we have? We have a couple more minutes. If, if folks have other questions, again, you're welcome to just write them in the chat if you're feeling uh, more literary than verbal. Um, and in the meantime, Slinko, I was wondering if, if you could talk more about working on the wall um, and 
sort of how long you've been doing that, what drew you in terms of this project? Did you know that you wanted to work on the wall immediately? Um, talking about this time in the studio. I don't know if you want to, you know. Yeah, I do want to talk about it. I'll, uh, well, remember the first time you showed me my studio, I was like, wow, these walls, right? But I didn't know that I would be working directly on the wall because I haven't really done that before. But what I did know, I wanted to, to try working at the scale. You know, I'm always confined to small spaces or small surfaces. In my mind, I always want to kind of go uh, to the extent of my body, you know, so the marks are the limit of my body because I feel more connected in that way. So the drawings were kind of like a physical exercise. You know, there's a lot of stepping up and down the ladder. There's a lot of walking back and forth. There's a, there's a lot of trying to remember which layer goes first, which layer. It's a whole uh, crazy choreography. Um, so I had to create like different layers to work off and number them all. So in a way it was like, you know, I don't know, it was, it was very interesting. And the other, my connection with the wall is uh, again, personal to me being, uh, a post-Soviet person and growing up in Ukraine, the wall is a mural surface and murals were so prevalent everywhere and murals carried images of these heroic workers and, in, in, you know, and beautiful uh, achievements in science and arts and whatnot. And I felt like I could think of this as the wall that no longer standing of this mural of, for, for the wall that has come down or a mural for things that shouldn't be in the mural, for things that are so kind of uh, void of um, meaning in some in some way. You know, they're grappling for they grasping for the meaning, but then they're constantly being overwritten by by economic calculus. So the value of things, the value of this object versus this object, is only retained as long as the economic value can be extracted. So that was very interesting to me. Um, and murals seemed like a very odd choice, but also very right choice. <laughs> and color was something you brought into this work relatively late. I mean, for the first, so for those who aren't familiar, the residencies at Triangle most often are three months. So Slinko is coming to the end. Um, the of, color appeared only in the last uh, three weeks. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, can you talk about that? So, you know, I, I'm very self-conscious about my Soviet, um, part of my Soviet identity. It's a very uneasy relationship, but I am so drawn to everything that I think, I think Slinko might be temporarily frozen. Wonderful things, so I felt like I could introduce these color smudges into the work, but also the color was almost like this, this, um, this bits of meaning and the bits of value still kind of circulating somewhere and, and going from one boundary to another and not quite possessed by any particular object. So color has a significance in this work and I'm uh, looking to explore that more. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. And Slinko, if you want to put, um, you know, your website or a way, a way to get in touch with you in the chat, sure, um, that would be great because then people can follow up with other questions. Um, but yeah, thank you. That was really wonderful and really informative. Um, and I'll I'll turn it over now to Ilana. Um, Ilana Harris Babu, um, take it away. Um. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone for coming out too. I'm excited to get to share my work with you. I thought that I would share sort of um, the two shows that I've been working on as like a way to introduce my practice and lot like as a whole because they're sort of like um, in and of themselves these like surveys of the past few years of my practice. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just going to make it so that I can maybe I can see you all. Well, maybe I can't see you all while I'm talking, but if, if uh, something comes up, you'll just holler. Um, but 
the two shows I've been working on while I've been here um, called Tasteful Interiors and um, Wholesome Fun are these um, are these installations of like the past five years of videos and, and sculptures that I've made and um, a newer work that I've been working on while I've been here. I've been lucky to have kind of, I guess you can see I have a lot of stuff around me. So I've been able to get a little bit more settled in here since I came earlier and then stuck around because of COVID. So this is, I'm coming now towards the end of my, um, wow, like six months here at Triangle. And during that time, I've been um, making a lot of like shooting new video, but also just sort of revisiting older sculptures that I've made in the past. And so I thought maybe I would start out by showing you this video that I made that's like a tour of my studio that uh, here that I made for someone else before, but I think is like a kind of um, a breakdown of how I relate to the sculptures. And then I can show you the actual videos and how I relate to those. Um, so this is just about like three and a half minutes and I'll play it. Going? Going. Cool. <laughs> Hello, welcome to my studio. I'm Alana Harris Babu. Um, my practice is interdisciplinary. Uh, it spans video and installation, but it's grounded in sculpture, namely um, clay. Uh, I like to make what I would call sort of a dysfunctional ceramics. And this came from a sort of series of videos that I was working on, thinking about uh, what I would call aspirational media. So home improvement shows, cooking shows, music television, beauty tutorials, things where there's a host who inhabits a cohesive, coherent world where they're surrounded by the things that they made and the things that make them. Um, so when I started making the objects, I was thinking about ideas like, what would a three foot spatula do to the way you think about flipping a pancake? Um, or how about, a, a ceramic hammer, a tool that would undo itself through its very use. Um, if I make this sort of object strange, how might that destabilize the ways that you relate to other sort of everyday aspects of your life? Um, I like to work in clay because it feels like it's the most immediate path from my hand to the object, something really sort of tactile that I can um, sort of jump right into and that feels accessible but is a material that you can build and build upon and can become more nuanced with time. So I'll show you around a little bit. So after I've made the sculptures, um, this is where sort of the next phase of the magic happens. So I shoot videos where I sort of activate these sculptures. I'll move them around, I'll touch them, I'll, I'll make up stories about these sculptures and what they could be, what they could be for, who it is that might use them. Um, and I like to really sort of play around in my videos. So I don't write a storyboard, I don't make a script. Um, what sort of resembles narrative really comes together in the editing process. So um, I'll show you the next part of my studio. I go ahead and... So, um, the next step is editing the video footage that I've made. Um, so I start off by just sort of moving things around. I'll set things to music. I'll break things. I'll see what can happen when the tactility of the object is transformed by the lens. What sort of stories can uh, these things inhabit? Um, it's, it's really editing for me is sort of a really playful time that allows me to kind of ground myself in a way that brings me back to the object making. So, I think that um, the best works of art are generous. I want my work ideally to sort of inspire other people to make work. Um, and by generosity, I really mean something that gives to the viewer more than it takes, that kind of incites a conversation that doesn't necessarily tell a viewer, but asks the viewer to sort of start to figure out their own answers. 
Um, to me, craft is really a way of seeing the world. It's a way of engaging with materials. So that gives you a kind of idea of what like physically is happening around me in this space right here when I'm cooking stuff up. Um, and so, like I said, I like think a lot about aspirational media. So in this first installation, Tasteful Interiors, which is at University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and it just opened this week actually, um, I've displayed like several of my videos from the past few years and these kind of pedestals that seem almost like sort of um, a retail type environment um, with the objects that I've made, which is like a sort of a common way I combine my videos. And in the videos, I do sort of, sort of like make up stories around these objects. Um, so in the case of this video that's in the front, um, which is called Decision Fatigue, I was thinking about like wellness, uh, culture, beauty culture, and, and made these sculptures while I was here that were like um, sort of looking at like thinking about yoni eggs or magical crystals. Um, I've been going a lot into like the Goop store, the Glossier store, and started to imagine this world where maybe like we come full circle, we want like car air freshener soap or Cheeto face serum, these sort of like toxic, sickly sweet um, objects of sorts. And uh, so I initially showed it in a space that looked kind of like this. So it had these plants and things like that too. Um, this was a, a made uh, a spar soap made out of an authentic Hamptons uh, flower that I got when I was doing a residency out there. Um, and so I then made a video where my mom pretended to be like a kind of a beauty wellness influencer, activating these objects and making up her own scenarios for how she would use them. Um, this kind of multi-step ritual. So I'll play an excerpt of the, the video that goes along with these called Decision Fatigue. Today I'll be showing you my daily clean beauty routine. I start by first cleaning my mirror. Today I'll be showing you my daily beauty routine but not breastfeeding. First, I start by washing my face. I like to start with one of these soaps. I like the chocolate chip one. It, it actually came from the Amazon, um, um, the forest of the Amazon, and it's very, very pure and natural. So I usually start with this one. I lather it up. So like in the case of this one, I, I made these sculptures. My mom started to make up the stories around them. And then the stories kind of evolved based off of the source material we were looking at. So I had seen this like magazine called Purists and Adventure and Wellness, which is this like Hampton specific beauty and wellness magazine and was really interested in their fixation on like perfect idealized forms of motherhood or purity or cleanliness or clean eating. And so my mom kind of goes through her own anecdotes of the choices she's made to remain well, whether that be breastfeeding or in her case, not breastfeeding because she was a nurse working full time, um, but also these kind of more um, her, her her routine for eating a TV dinner or something like that. Or her um, it culminates with her um, Cheeto uh, face mask, which some people find totally like sort of blood curdling. Yeah, but it's really fun. And I think for me, I like always kind of sit somewhere between this like humor and this um, and sort of use humor as a way to digest more painful realities. So when you walk around the pedestal, then you come to um, an installation of an earlier work I made called um, Cooking with the Erotic, which is a two channel video. Um, and it goes along with um, these sculptures that I call like my dysfunctional ceramics, like I said before, which are these sort of home implements kind of distorted and made strange. Um, and so this video, um, 
uh, has been installed in a few different ways, but it's a cooking show sort of that uses Audre Lorde's um, uh, speech, the uses of the erotic, the erotic as power as sort of like a, a playbook for a recipe that goes in a million different directions. Um, and I'll play an excerpt of that for you too. Welcome to the cooking show today. Thank you so much for joining me. Now there are many kinds of power, both those used and unused, acknowledged and otherwise. The erotic is a resource that lies within each one of us and comes from a very deep female and spiritual play. Rooted in the power that comes from our unexpressed and unrecognized feelings. The power that comes from sharing deeply with another person forms a bridge between the sharers. We'll be building, we'll be cooking, and we'll be having a great time. Stay tuned. We have something great coming up next. Um, yeah, so this we go through a whole bunch of different recipes, whether it's how to drill a table while also cutting limes, smoothie time, there's a nail painting demo while spoiling water. Um, and I like to think about how all these different spaces of creation are like similar to or different from one another. So how is the cooking show host soundstage similar to or different from the ideas we have about a genius artist flinging around paint between white walls? Or um, like maybe uh, what we would think about like a sort of a man cave tool shed. How is that similar to or different from my grandma cooking pig's feet in the kitchen? You know, which kinds of creative labor are revered and which ones are considered mundane? Um, and I often like to kind of mix together those gestures um, and also the, the gestures, we, outcomes we expect related to utility or uselessness. Um, I also like think about how in the case of like a cooking show, the host will like stare into the camera and they'll say like, today I'm me and you're you and we're gonna make um, matcha cookies, right? And embedded within that we is this assumption of shared background experiences and also kind of a shared present tense. And so I like to kind of throw some some wrenches into those gears of assumptions around taste and tastefulness and what's in good taste and poor taste. Um, and so, so yeah, I'll have some of those sculptures, or I do have some of those sculptures in the space with the video um, on pedestals like this, with each kind of section being painted like a kind of a wall color, like this one being a sort of cream that sort of sets the stage for that space. Um, and another space I have in there uh, is a video that I made called Finishing a Raw Basement. Um, with my mom, which is kind of a home improvement show, um, maybe for individual like cooking. I was looking a lot at like things like this old house and like kind of home and garden television um, shows where there are these two hosts. And so I, it has a video playing in the center and then a pegboard with these sculptures that you can also kind of see behind me here because um, I'm working on another set of them for um, Homburg. And so these kind of hang on, on the wall, these sort of tools. And I like kind of making these things that are 
sort of the world within arm's reach so that I can go between something really small and specific of the gesture of like squeezing a bit of clay back to these sort of larger picture things that happen when I edit video and I'm able to tie in like all kinds of contexts and words and language into one place and that I could put the sculptures and the videos together and tell like a more embodied maybe haptic sort of a narrative and then also one that's grounded in the words that I'm sharing. And so I'll play a little bit of this video for you too, um, so you can get an idea of that space. Welcome back. Today, we're going to show you how to finish a raw basement or unfinish it if you've gone too far. We'll be working in a great space, open concept, vaulted ceilings and white to match the gallery upstairs. I brought along a friend to show us how. We're gonna have a great time. Great to see you. It's good to be back. You know, a lot of us, we want to expose our raw bricks, but we're too shy to do it in public. I'm going to show you how to get it done in a few quick and simple steps. Let's go down to the man cave. Let's do it. So you can see, this is a great space. Open concept, vaulted ceilings, modern concept. It has that rustic appeal. So Classic. yeah, the words will come from bits and pieces. So things that I had when I was just living alone uh, and having the TV play in the background, the words that they would say again, modern, mid-century, classic, um, those kinds of words that sometimes we often take for granted, um, mixed up with, uh, in this case, when I started to think about home ownership and who has access to these kinds of projects, sort of we'll take language from like Marcus Garvey talking about um, self-determination and home ownership that way. Uh, there's a moment in the video where we kind of get disillusioned and we're standing out here uh, in front of the pool and... You know, this is not my vision. This is not what I planned for. Like I told them, you can't dismantle the master's house with the masses tools. Yeah, of course. I mean, I hope we can really turn this so, around. So yeah, so maybe sort of plugging other kinds of ideas or more radical ideas into these, um, these sort, of, sort of more mundane like formats or something. Um, and so all of those works will kind of go in, are in that installation now. And right now in the space around me in the studio, I'm figuring out how to translate this all for um, Germany too. So in my last kind of minute, I'll just, show you around the sketch up as best as I can. Um, but so there's going to be, this is like the floor plan of the space um, for Wholesome Fun uh, called Kunsthaus Homburg. And like, if I zoom in here, this like kind of silhouette, that's like the scale of a person, this, this character right here. So it's really, really big. And I'm trying to figure out, I've been trying to figure out how to fill it up. And it would have been impossible without the like amazing studio that I have here to even begin to try to figure out how to stage something at this scale. But up front, you'll see there's also going to be a sort of a pink zone that'll have um, decision fatigue and then sort of the pegboard and finishing a raw basement will go back here. Um, there'll be some collages and a newer work that I've been working on that I didn't get the time to necessarily flesh out with you all, but I'll share a link to it with you here. And so right now the puzzle for this is I'm trying to figure out how to make a video show that has in a space with this many windows. So um, it's been fun trying to solve these problems while I've been here. Um, and I'll go ahead and stop sharing now so you all can ask any questions you might have. Yeah, I mean, um, folks can post questions in the chat or um, raise your hand, which you can do down at the bottom of your screen um, under reactions. So that's one way to do it. Or you can also, if you have your camera on, you can just go like this and we'll, <laughs> we'll see you um, and you can unmute. But I, 
I have a question, Ilana, um, which is, I'm just curious to hear you talk about the um, music in the videos because it's so evocative of certain kinds of TV shows and other kinds of things. So I'm curious to hear you talk about that. And then um, Karen, I think I see your hand possibly too. Um, so uh, maybe if you wanna talk for a second about the music and then we can move yeah. there. Um, yeah, the music, um, it comes from like, say in the case of um, like cooking with the erotic, I was watching a lot of like, there used to be on the front page of New York Times, like Melissa Clark had this food, these like two minute video cooking things. And so I took a few notes from the beginning of that and then looped it and then sort of asked my friend to help me figure out how to make, I, I gave, often I'll give my friends who make music sort of word propositions. So I was like, make a trap remix of this or something. And then that became something. But then throughout that um, piece, the sound goes on to be coming from other references. Like um, when we're doing a recipe to do with butter, I'll have like the kind of part of the track of Truffle Butter by Nicki Minaj in there, or I'll, there'll be little bits, samplings of like Soul Food by Goody Mob that I'll then remix into something else. Um, so then maybe some viewers will recognize those songs and others won't. And I like the idea that you could access the pieces from many different ways. Um, so yeah, the sound is kind of collaged together and there may be a similar way to the other kinds of language in the videos. Yeah, and kind of um, on that topic, you were describing and you were showing us at the end um, the kind of layout for your show in Germany. And then you mentioned your show in Tennessee. And so these are two quite, both quite large exhibition spaces that if I'm not mistaken, you plan both of these shows without ever visiting the space or, or at least without yeah. being in the space. How is that? Can you talk about that process? Yeah it's, yeah, it's been weird. I've never been there. I guess with COVID times, it's like, yeah, like trying to live out a lot of this stuff and sketch up and then trusting the curator to know what the space will be like too. And um, I mean, it has been really like fortunate to like stay with this wall behind me here. Like I can actually lay out the pegboard to scale. Like this is actually the scale that it'll be in Hamburg. And so like, that's been super helpful too. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I was like, I really, yeah, want to see the shows and be able to travel and be able to go to Hamburg and see how it actually happens. Cause also it's like, if you spend so much, like spend a whole year thinking about something like this, you want it, everyone else gets to see the show, but you, you know? Yeah. Very bizarre experience, which I think a lot of artists and just people in general are, are having that kind of. Yeah. Uh, experience of, of distance. Yeah. Um, well, we have another couple minutes. And actually, another thing that I've wanted to ask you um, oh, Allison, so I can throw this question to you from Allison um, Quo. Um, can you talk about working with your mom as a performer? Which actually, Allison, I was going to ask the same question. So that's perfect. Oh yeah, this is, you know, this is always the question. <laughs> uh, my mom is like such a ham. So she loves it. She's not actually acting anyone. She's been kind of being herself sort of. Um, she never like cooked or anything grew up. She'd only go into the kitchen because there was this mirror there and she'd do her own kind of fake Julia Child's routine like for herself in front of the kitchen tools, you know, and then go back. So always performing. Um, but I'd say like in the case of something like decision fatigue, I it's mostly her improvising. And then maybe I'll give a proposition, like what would your daily beauty routine be for eating a TV dinner? And then with the sculptures in front of her, she'll like make up stories or talk about her own anecdotes. And then obviously in things like cooking with the erotic, there are parts where we're saying things directly from specific texts, um, but there's never like an all out script. It's kind of going back and forth and then the narrative comes together like when I'm editing in the editing process. But um, Allison was asking, does she pitch you video ideas? And I was sort of wondering. Yeah, yeah. yeah she does. Um, sometimes they're like good or like give, she definitely gave me a lot of good ideas to do with reparations that then became something more when we were saying repairs a lot and finishing our own basement. But I definitely got a text from her like a few months ago. She was like, 
BMX biking. And I'm like, what? And she's like, I saw these videos on YouTube, BMX bikes. I think that it'll really appeal to people. <laughs> and I'm, you know, and so, yeah. So good suggestions abound definitely from her. Yeah, I feel like she's on the right track with that. I think that yeah. that, could, that could be very popular. <laughs> um, one other thing I was wondering about is um, taste. I mean, I think you use the word taste metaphorically to talk about, you know, different tastes that people have in terms of their home and things that they, um, that they have around them, but also it's, you know, this is a very obvious point, but there's so much to do with food and like literal taste in your work. And then even thinking about your sculpture, like there's this element of like these sort of things that look like they've been dipped in something that you could taste or lick or that's like dripping down or whatever, melting stuff. And I was just curious, I don't even know if I have like a real question formed, but I'm just curious to hear you, yeah, talk about taste and that sort of metaphor and like literal aspect of it. Yeah, I guess like all it taken in all iterations, it reifies a set of desires and those who might have access to those desires. But also, yeah, taste is just a way of knowing that, uh, knowing the world that is so essential and important to all of us. And it's hard to speak to sometimes just with the image, you know, or even just with sound. And so I think I evoke it and I'm always feeling it. And I, I feel like when I like a sculpture I've made, it definitely looks delicious to me, even if I don't actually taste it. Um, but so I guess my answer to your question is yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you definitely feel it very viscerally, both in the, vid in the videos and the sculpture. I, I think that's a huge connection between them. Um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ilana, um, for sharing that thank work. Thank you. Congratulations on the, on the shows. And I wish we could all go to both Hamburg and Chattanooga, Tennessee, really different places just to see them. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you all so much. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeffrey. Um, thanks again, Ilana. And Jeffrey, I'll, I'll just hand things over to you. Thank you, Ilana, and thank you, Novo. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us tonight. I'm really excited to see so many familiar faces uh, that you're taking your time out of dinner time to be with us. And let's see one second. So I'm going to share images of a body of work that's really important to me and continues to lead a lot of my studio investigations. And let's see, sorry. Mm. Ah, there you go. All right, sweet. All right, cool. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so this body of work that I'm showing right now is called Now You See Me, Now You Don't. And I've been more or less thinking about this work for the last two years. And I made this work around the time that I was just finishing grad school. I did my MFA at Columbia University. And I finished in 2019. One unfortunate night I was taking the subway from Harlem 125th Street and I was about to head downtown and I swiped my turnstile, my card at the turnstile and it said insufficient funds. I swiped again and it said insufficient funds. And the third time that I swiped, my card said, sorry, the, the final time that I swiped, it said insufficient funds. And me knowing that I had money on, on, my, on my card, I jumped the turnstile. And shortly after jumping, two cops came after me. I got a ticket. And on the ticket, my height was just a six foot seven. And my weight is 250 pounds. And I've never been either of those things. I'm six foot two and I weigh 180 pounds. And so that incident really got me to think about my body and how it, how it reads and articulates or misregisters in space, right? What's my relationship to architecture? And really thinking about it in this expansive, um, in this expansive sense, right? Thinking about that culturally, politically, and also socially, and also economically. Um, and so I went to court, I fought the case, and long story short, 
this produced this body of work that you now see, now you see me, now you don't. And I think about these pieces as being these vessels almost of um, sort of like this racialized violence, right? I think of these as being surrogates, right? These projections that we, that society tends to project on bodies that look and operate like mine in the world. And so this is a series of seven kinetic sculptures and they each have their own sort of meta narrative. The title of this one is The Block is Hot. And I'm going to play a short video really quickly. Okay. Sorry, wrong one. And this is how these pieces exist in space and time. And so there's, so all of these sculptures essentially do the same thing. All these sculptures essentially do the same thing and operate either on a horizontal or vertical axis. And so what's happening is this cast of my body is slowly grinding itself against this perforated sheet metal. And this one is not kinet kinetic. This one actually came before the Now You See Me, Now You Don't sculptures, but I still think about them as being quite relational. And this one moves on a horizontal plane. I'm gonna just like move a little bit quickly for the sake of time. And I also have this bricolage where a lot of my practice is metalworking. Uh, in these sculptures, everything's made out of steel. Uh, and later on in my practice, I move on to working with, with aluminum and other forms of metal. But in the earlier days of me metal working, I used mostly steel and that becomes really important in the later work that I produce. I also work a lot with um, found objects. So like this very bricolage way of, this bricolage sort of Frankenstein way of making sculpture. And this sculpture is called Banan. I was born in Haiti, um, grew up in the Bahamas. My first tongue is Haitian Creole. And in Haitian Creole, that's not really, the word for penis and banana uh, the same. So really thinking about how um, people from places like mine get exoticized, not only by the external, but also the internal. And this next, this next work, this, this piece is sort of a pivotal piece for me because this is where the work that I start to make really changes. So I did Next Haven last year, which is a residency in New Haven, Connecticut. And when I arrived into New Haven, they were basically still building the institution architecturally. And I have like this really profound interest in architecture. And there, were, there was this giant sliding door that this fireproof door that they were getting rid of. And you can look in the background and see this would have been where this door would, would have existed, but they were replacing it with these super sleek glass doors. And this door spoke to me. It really reminded me of that mythological figure that was created of my body by that police officer when I got that ticket, right? The six foot seven, 250 pound Hulkian figure. And so, I decided to make a sculpture sort of referencing that. But then at the same time thinking about, so I really don't like when people call me Jeff. It's always Jeffrey and never Jeff because I always feel like Jeff is such a reductivist gesture. Uh, but the company that I would buy my medals from in Connecticut would always label my material as Jeff, even after asking them to not do that. So. The sculpture really is about how two things could coexist in one form, right? On the one hand, I have like this 
policing system that's creating this hulky and figure out of me. And then at the same time, I'm being reduced into something that's smaller than me um, by, by this institution that I buy material from. And this image is uh, from my first solo show at White Columns earlier in the winter of 2021. And the idea here is that these doors are meant to sort of uh, block the view of the exhibition and you have to sort of either go left or right. Uh, and this, this, this work, this body of work, the exhibition was called Still Standing, but this work became really important to the way that I'm making now. I started making these paintings. Um, most of my work is sculpture, but now oddly I'm making more paintings and drawings than I am sculptures right now. So I started making these paintings that you see in this image. And so essentially I went to Skowhegan right after finishing grad school and I put my work in storage and it was a terrible storage unit with no, air con no humidity or moisture control or any of that stuff. And so all of my work rusted. And essentially I spent the first two months of my time at Nexhaven cleaning off um, rust from these sculptures. And at a certain point, I realized that I was not just cleaning off rust. These sculptures were grounded in the sense of racialized trauma and violence. And so in a lot of ways, I think about them conceptually as being me healing and me cleansing and me caring and me trying to heal those damaged wounds. So conceptually, that's the way that I think about these paintings. I also think about these in relationship to ecology, both, both in terms of like, you know, rust is like this environmental issue, but also race is also an ecological um, system of understanding or the way that I think about it. Uh, and this is what the paintings look like uh, in person, close up. So it's, it's essentially old t-shirts that have been soaked with acetic acid, which is a very mild acid, very similar to vinegar and old t-shirts. And they all have their own names. This one is called Fire in the Heart. And homeostasis. And so they all pretty much uh, do the same thing. And uh, now I'm starting to experiment a little bit more with form and adding graphics and text into the work. So really trying to treat these a little bit more printmaking painting like instead of like just um, flat sculptures. And these are some install images. And um, also for the solo show, I decided to take out the electric motors and start to use um, these hand cranks. So the viewer was allowed to play or destroy these sculptures depending on what perspective you're looking at it from. And this is another one of those paintings that I made most recently for Uncommon Proximities at James Cohen, which just closed last weekend. And this piece is called Fairy Godmother. That's a detail. And these button-like um, elements, those are stainless steel snaps. And that references my welding jacket, since so much of the work that I do is metalworking. Uh, but essentially, I think of that as being a cloak or a shield um, it's, that protects me. So in a lot of ways, I think about that as being referential to that tool that I use in my practice. Ooh. And this guy is called just above my head. So same prank system. And this is uh, the block is hot again. I showed this piece at, I showed this twice, the first time at Voices and the second time at uh, Statues Also Die at Real Artways in Connecticut. And this is probably the closest it got to actually dying or um, destroying itself. And from here, I started making these drawings using the information that falls from the sculptures. This is plaster particles on roofing paper and double-sided tape. As I said earlier, I'm from the Bahamas and right now is hurricane season and uh, storms travel between June and November. And so after a really bad hurricane, 
uh, there would be this material all over the ground because people roofs would have been blown um, away. And so this is a material to me that's very uh, culturally specific and has like a cultural economy that I'm very interested in. And I use a double-sided tape to adhere that information onto this roofing paper to make these abstracted images. And this is an ongoing series of works. This is um, some of this I made at Triangle Arts for a show that I'm having in the Bahamas next month. And so these feel very cosmic, um, sort of like a different way of making for me is normally like things are very structured and uh, and everything sort of makes sense. And these ones are a lot more free form, free flowing. And I started making smaller pieces too, because I tend to make art to the scale of my body. And uh, even though I'm not six foot seven and 250 pounds, I'm also not tiny. <laughs> uh, and the last piece that I'll show, share with y'all is uh, this guy. Hold on, let me turn my AC on because it's hot in here. You're right back. Sorry. Okay, and so the last piece that I'm gonna, oh, that does not sound very sexy. Can y'all hear me? Nova, is that okay? It doesn't sound that loud to me, but um, if people want to give thumbs up or just let Jeffrey know that it's okay, it's not. It doesn't. It's it's not okay. that loud for my microphone. All right, cool. Okay, so this is the last piece that I'm going to share. Um, when I was living up in New Haven, I knew I lived in a neighborhood called Dixwell, which is uh, predominantly black, and unfortunately, that comes with a lot of its challenges, especially in this country. Uh, and every now and again, I would like find these bullets on the street and I started collecting them. And I, this was during the pandemic and I'm like, why is the bullets on the street in the middle of like this pandemic? And, and, um, after George Floyd's unfortunate murder, uh, witnessing how many fireworks there was all over the country, that also had like a major impact on my brain and just seeing and hearing and it felt like the country was literally on fire for most of last summer. And so really thinking about that. So I was really thinking about boom, right? Like thinking about like both the, the sort of phonetic, but also the visual like vernacular of that. And another thing that coincided was also, uh, I realized somewhere around the turn of the pandemic that my work had also started to shift, even though I didn't like really talk about it much. I think about these paintings in relationship to care, right? Um, is, the sculptures are sort of grounded within this language of trauma. And so the paintings become like this gesture of repair and healing and care and maintenance. And likewise, I also started to, I became really into plants over the pandemic. And so that also started to creep into the work that I was making in my studio as well. And so this is a sketch for a sculpture that eventually would be the second work that I had included in Uncommon Proximities at James Cohen. <clears throat> and, and so this, this is sort of what the sculpture turned out being. So these, the, the bullet form inspired the ceramics that, um, that became the planters for these plants. And this spider leaf plant was the first plant that I, started caring for, I realized that it was just too taxing and exhausting to always be talking about blackness in relationship to a sort of trauma or lack. And so I wanted to really put myself and put the people who I think I'm speaking in collaboration with in, in this conversation of like 
care and healing and futurity. So that's really the way that I think about I, what, are, what are ways in which I can be intentional about the ways in which I live my life. And for me, having a green thumb is one of those. And so I started taking care of this one spider leaf plant and I didn't know at the time that this plant can propagate forever. And so essentially all of these plants in the sculpture come from one single mother plant. <clears throat> and and um, the lights, it's because it's in a gallery space and I needed to reproduce the sunlight that I was getting inside my studio. So it's like, oh, of course, it's gonna be a chandelier. But the architecture of the plant also, the architecture of the sculpture also mimics the architecture of the plants, but also the architecture of a firework, one of those fountain fireworks that I'm obsessed with. And then another thing that happened in my practice as well with the shifting of the years, I, my material choices changed a, a bit. I um, became, I became, um, oh, sorry, what did I do? Oh, I, I really was thinking about the word levity and really thinking about lightness, right? Because I was working so much with steel and um, steel is very dense and tough. Like you think about steel, you think about bridges and airplanes and that kind of stuff. And aluminum has like a softness. It has a relationship to the body. Um, it's in your deodorant and appliances that we use. So it, it has this closeness. And I'm remaking this sculpture or one very similar for uh, Socrates Sculpture Park that will open in October. And then I think I have one more image. This is um, one of those paintings that I did earlier. And this is for an exhibition that's opening in the Bahamas September 10th. Um, these ones are a bit different in the sense that I'm working with this super high finish uh, aluminum so the frames sort of reflect back to you. So really thinking about like different textural marks. And I was supposed to make this more conversational but I failed epically at that and I'm really sorry. Uh, but if you do have questions, I will entertain them and entertain you. There, there are a couple questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see, but um, Jody uh, Linky Chow, who was a former resident at Triangle um, earlier this year, was asking, "How big are these new works?" Uh, they are about sixty inches tall by forty inches wide. Not small, but also not gigantic. I'm still failing at making small work. Can you talk about scale? Yeah, like sort of. Yeah, like so I have this. I have this thing where I feel like Vincent's these drawings that the drawings that I make, these are all made in relationship. Let's see. Ugh, come on, work. Okay, these drawings, Vincent's, these are all made in relationship to the scale of my body. So roughly about seventy-two inches, a little bit taller than seventy-two inches tall. Um, and about half the span of my body in terms of width. Uh, and also when I initially started making these, the goal was to make 23, make this a series of 23 works. And the idea is that my body fits into a subway car, a New York subway car roughly 52 times, sorry, not 52, 23 times in that configuration. And so that was like the idea. So thinking about, um, thinking about scale in this micro macro, me being the micro and the, like that architectural system being the macro. Uh, and then I have this other rule, this is weird. And uh, this is weird, but I recently told myself, I have a car. I recently told myself, if it can't fit in my car, I'm not making it, but I fail at that every time. So I'm, I'm like, at this point, I'm like a part-time U-Haul trucker and a full-time artist. Which I can attest to that because there's a lot of you going in and out. Like I have to move my car, I have to park. <laughs> and Dumbo is not an easy place to park. So yeah. Um, there's another question from um, Karen Wilkin asking, um, do you think of the elements in the rust paintings as metaphorical skins? Yeah, yeah. So I, so I, I'm, I'm, there's the, I think about them as being like a couple of things. 
one, I'm, I'm interested, I'm interested in the body. Uh, so I'm interested in the body without actually having to rep the way. I'm um, just cause that's, I'm just not right there. Right. I'm not at that place in my practice right now where I feel like I need to be literal about the work that I'm making. Um, so yes, I do think about them as being um, sort of a surrogate or stand in for uh, the skin or body. So the exhibition that I'm having at Mester Projects opening September 10th uh, is called Free Body. And so it's, it's to do with physics, but it's also to do with like literally um, this body that's able to like be free of associations or be free of the confines of um, this sort of corporeal state. Uh, but also I think about them um, I think about them um, as being as much to do with like an inwardness as much as an outwardness, right? Because um, particularly the blood, right? Because the, it, chemically the blood and rust, the blood and rust sort of mirror each other chemically in that way. So I'm interested in how, how does how does stimuli that's external like rust is something that happens on the outside and blood is something that happens on the inside how how awesome nature is in some ways right but also thinking about um <clears throat> iron specifically right even though i'm not using mig welding anymore i still think about this as being a sort of welding process if you will um just because of the iron content inside the paintings And then lastly, sorry, I almost forgot. Uh, shout out to Sydney, by the way. I'm from the Bahamas and we have a festival in the Bahamas called Junkanoo. And that, that, that process, Junkanoo is this uh, festival that predates the transatlantic slave trade. And so it has heavy roots in West Africa. And so there's these trumps that uh, during the Junkanoo festival, they have like a very sacred place in Bahamian cultural society. And I like my first visual language was Junkanoo. So in some ways, I think I'm playing with that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And I, I don't know if you can see, but um, Sydney has a question in the chat. Um, you seem to have a theme of labor threaded in your work. How do you relate to and reconcile with the concept of labor? A lot of black trauma is rooted in labor and self-healing is a laborious task. <laughs> I love that question so much uh, because I, I, I think I have like a really unhealthy relationship with work, to be honest, that I'm like still trying to make sense with. This is, I mean, in all like humbleness, this is probably being, uh, the most I've said no to things in my life, right? Just because I had to sort of check myself, right? Like you can't be saying that your work is about this and yet you're coming home and you're too exhausted to make dinner and you just pass out and it's like the same hamster wheel, right? So so yeah, I, I appreciate that question a lot because it's like, it, it's, it's almost, it, it becomes about like practicing what you preach, right? Because I can't, I can't be saying that I'm interested in care and all this stuff and I'm not taking care of myself. And so I'm also being trying to live as glamorous of a life as I can using the small resources that I have. I don't really answer your question, but I, I just, yeah. <laughs> um, this is almost just like a clarifying question is I was wondering, um, I, did you use the word grace? Did you talk about, it sounded like you said grace was it, um, an ecological system or something. I don't know if I'm getting that right, but I was curious. Grace, is, grace could be ecological too. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just think the way that race manifests itself, like, you know, like, I think, uh, I think, the way that we think about climate change and the way that we think about race, all of these things are all interdependent, right? Absolutely. And thank you, um, Barry in the chat is confirming that you said race and I totally heard you wrong. Um, but Layla, you have your hand up. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, 
Can I share a feedback? Yeah. Um, I really love your work. And I think you're, uh, the way that you're exploring the method deep you think about an idea and it became a, your everyday concern and you are finding it through like whatever is around you and i think uh whatever you were uh talking about the relationship between body and race and also how as a sculptor you were using a steel I found out your pieces with the fabric is so fascinating and it's really, really on the point because the rust on the fabric and also those like little like dots of like, I don't know what is aluminum or whatever. I think that is really great idea how you connect those pieces and you, you're showing the conflict with a soft and like, soft material like cloth and plus those like metal things mm -hmm. and also when you stretching it in in the frame like for me as an outsider i i i feel like that's how like this group of people are trying their self to uh, stretch their self and fit in in this kind of like world but um they have their own way. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think uh, the playfulness of the rust on the fabric and giving a kind of a tonality of like various brown, that's like so interesting. That's like how you're playing with that. And I think like, I'm really seeing this series of work like exactly what you are explaining about your concerns and your thoughts those are really beautiful like congratulations really thank you i appreciate that oh karen will the elements in the kinetic sculptures eventually be destroyed by the movement then what so i that's um these these works are meant to be or the way that i think about them is like these I tend to work in series, but this particular body of work, now you see me, now you don't, it's sort of like one and that's that's it. And that's why I started making the drawings because I was having a really hard time with what to do with all of that information once this thing has been pulverized and starts to disintegrate. Luckily, I've not gotten to that point yet, but the idea is that the work sort of lives on in these paintings and also the drawings. I, I, even though they're drawings, I also oddly think about them as being photographs because they're documenting in some ways. This, this, it's, it's documenting an action in, in a non-traditional way of thinking about what a camera does. That's a really fascinating point and it's a great place to, to end because we've, we've kind of run out of time, but thank you so, so much, Jeffrey. That was really fascinating. Um, and if Jeffrey, if you and if actually all three artists could again share, you know, your website or a way to check out more of your work, um, folks can, can copy that down and it would be a great way for the audience to follow up if they have other questions or thoughts. Um, but this has been a great conversation. Um, that concludes our summer open studios. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us um, and especially to our artists. Uh, it was such a pleasure to share the work that's happening in studios here in Dumbo. Um, thank you, Slinko, Alana, and Jeffrey. Um, and thank you all thank for joining you. us. We look forward to seeing you all in person soon. And if, if folks want to unmute and just give a kind of round of applause or a thank you, <laughs> um, you're welcome to, well, welcome to unmute um, because this has been so, so lovely. Um, on this hot, humid night to all come together. Um, thank so, you. Yes, thank you, Ilana, Jeffrey, and Slinko. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all in person soon, universe willing, this will happen. Um, so we really look forward to that. And we'll sign off now. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.